Stop me if you've heard this one before. Superhero media's gone woke. There's some sort of agenda at play here, from the big companies, from DC, from Marvel, from Disney, and it's plainly evident that this is the case if you just look at the source material. People say this kind of thing a lot, and it's silly, obviously, for all the reasons you're already aware of, but it's also a weird point to make for another reason, one you might not be aware of. Because the knee-jerk reaction here might be to give a response like, hey, it isn't the 60s anymore, modern comics and adaptations can either slavishly recreate the characters, dynamics, world building, and so on that these characters started out with in a different world, or they can try and make a product for the 21st century, for modern audiences, and do Doing the latter doesn't erase those origins, it just builds on them. But I think doing that kinda misses the point, or at least misses a point. There's an idea that's dormant beneath a lot of discussions like this, even among defenders of the culture's efforts toward greater inclusivity, that superhero media, whether on page or on screen, has diversified over the past few decades to match a diversifying audience, a diversifying world, or at least a diversifying America. There's an idea that the mostly white, mostly male led, implicitly Protestant, implicitly heterosexual status quo of the 50s and 60s, the Silver and Bronze Age of Comics, where most of the current A-list characters were born or matured into their current versions, was fine for the time, but that since then, the world's changed, and that this culture needs to reflect this. While I'm sure there is some truth to this, for instance, I've no doubt that more figures from minority groups read comics today than did 50 years ago, it's only a partial truth. Because that status quo, that time before Carol Danvers went feminist, before Superman was Kal-El's bisexual son, before Wakanda was a hyper-advanced, uncolonized land, that was not a mirror to the world outside. America was diverse. African, Asian, Latino Americans, they were already there. Of course they were. They'd been there decades, centuries even. Remember, the 50s and 60s saw the eruption of civil rights movements and the popularization of second wave feminism. This was a time of tumult and social progress, the likes of which weren't seen again for decades afterward. The assumption you may well make if you think about this is that maybe these things were starting to change, but that change takes time to organize flow into the nooks and crannies of middle-class culture. It's not like there was some agenda that was insulating these comic books, these worlds, these characters from the social and cultural forces of the day, right? Right? Oh no, it's the foreshadowing police! You've probably heard of the Comics Code Authority. A lot of people are aware that this existed, but only in vague terms. They know that it banned comics from using words like horror and terror in their titles, that it banned nudity, but not too much more. What are they missing, then? Well, for one, the context. The CCA was an arm of the conservative moral panic that swept the nation after Joseph McCarthy and his Red Scare crashed into public consciousness. It was based indirectly on the Hayes Code, which Hollywood adopted around 1930 following government pressure, a set of strictly enforced moralistic guidelines drafted mainly by Will Hayes, a Presbyterian elder and former head of the Republican National Committee. That code was based around cleaning up Hollywood's outputs, and it prohibited a lot of stuff, including interracial relations, offence to the clergy, and sexual perversion, which, yes, means anything remotely non-hetero. The Comics Code though was far stricter, owing to the specific moral panic that children were at risk of being perverted by deviant ideas, i.e. stuff outside of normative Christian morality. The more things change, eh? Basically though, if a book didn't meet code, it didn't get sold. And to begin with, at least, that meant basically anything even slightly outside of ideal conservative mores. I'm not exaggerating. One now infamous case saw comics publisher William Gaines attempt to reprint a pre-code story named Judgment Day in 1956 after the CCA had been established. The story was rejected because the protagonist was black. It didn't matter that the book actually met the code, illustrated a moral lesson, using this character to tell an anti-discrimination story. The CCA wouldn't approve. Gaines did what countless others wouldn't have, and doubtless didn't do in similar situations now lost to history. He called their bluff and threatened to take this story to the press if the Judgment Day reprint didn't get clearance, and eventually the Code Authority did relent, this time. Because after this, the CCA kept objecting, kept restricting Gaines's comics, until this pressure drove him out of the comic book industry altogether. The Code's cultural chokehold extended beyond race, though. Per QualityComics.com, one central effect of the Code was to, quote, create an industry-wide interest in the value of women in the home, and the sanctity of marriage. 
As a result, women were kept outnumbered, outranked, and generally on the peripheries of these worlds. Pre-code female characters weren't exactly brilliantly realised. In the Golden Age of comics, they mostly featured as little more than sex objects or victims of brutality, but there were exceptions, and those exceptions were enjoyed by women. When Wonder Woman was first introduced, her readership was around 50% female. Needless to say, as the code dominated, this changed. In the following decades, women featured mostly as companions, allies, sometimes heroines, yes, but almost never leaders. Second best to men. Most of Marvel's major female characters, even to this day, got their start under the code, and their early existence was characterised by domesticity and subordinance. Sue Storm almost immediately becomes Sue Richards. Jane Foster, ditzy nurse and sometimes girlfriend. Carol Danvers started as Captain Marvel's girlfriend. Her subsequent heroism is named for and follows after the former male hero, and so on. It was only as the code's influence lessened in the following decades that a modicum of independence, any hint of a non-normative, non-nuclear, <gasps> feminist conception of womanhood would be granted to any of these characters, paving the way for their current iterations. While the code wasn't as explicit around non-Christian religious practices as it was with, say, anything other than normative sexual practices, diversifying on this front was often just as taboo. We've touched on this a little in some previous videos, and I've no doubt we will again in the future, but while the largely Jewish writers of these early stories injected their heroes with fantasies of a successful double life of passing and assimilation, they couldn't really go any further. The etiquette was to leave things ambiguous, but wherever necessary to hint that these characters were basically Christian, and mostly Protestant. Exceptions did begin to appear, but again, mostly once the code had loosened its grip on the industry. It's probably also worth pointing out that while the early comic book industry was largely male and largely Jewish, thanks to, you know, the whole medium being built by Jewish creatives in the preceding years, these mostly white, mostly male-dominated comic book status quos aren't just the result of a fairly localised, somewhat insular industry. The writers of that Judgment Day story were white and Jewish. There was a segregation law on the books until 1957 that prevented black comic writers and illustrators from working in mainstream comic studios, for goodness sake. So this isn't a story about comics not being diverse purely because the industry's lineage was naturally homogenous. This is a story about systemic blocks to artistic expression that ended up shaping our image of classic comics. This is a story about conservative moral panic, and the codification of that panic. This is a story about an agenda. And not some speculative agenda, cooked up by conspiratorial losers fishing for cheap clicks on the internet, but an agenda which objectively, empirically existed, and whose effects are still being felt, and almost invisibly underpin every discussion of diversity and accuracy in comic book media we have today. Because of the Comics Code Authority and the way it swaddled this nascent medium in a deceptive blanket of McCarthy-era normative values, values, the upshot is this. All subsequent efforts to diversify and expand the demographics of superheroism look like overcorrection, even if statistically they aren't, because of what they're being compared to, subconsciously or otherwise, this enforced white, male, Protestant, hetero status quo of the 50s and 60s. And the salient point here isn't merely that this status quo doesn't reflect the world of today, it's that it didn't reflect then either. Not accurately, not authentically. So maybe today's comics, today's ad adaptations are more diverse than a lot of the material they're ultimately based on. But maybe that basic fact isn't evidence of some modern, far-reaching, woke agenda operating in the shadows at Marvel and DC. Maybe this recent push of inclusion is just the absence of a previous agenda whose effects you'd been taking for granted. Food for thought. And as we wrap up, I'm sure some of you are thinking that it's awfully bold of me to have titled this little discussion about these codes and agendas, THE Superhero Diversity Problem. But that's not this video's title specifically. That's the title of this video's series, a series that begins here. Because there is a problem, a broad, multifaceted one, in the way this discourse is had. And instead of trying to address it all in one gargantuan video, I'm going to chip away at it in shorter episodes like this one every now and then. Maybe Maybe every couple of weeks, maybe every couple of months, maybe just whenever something else I'm working on doesn't get done in time and I need a smaller video to upload. 
That's what happened this time. I'm putting together another Andor video, and I didn't manage to get it done for today. That's coming soon, though, and I think it's some of my best work yet, so if you're new here, make sure you subscribe. You wouldn't want to miss it. Either way, I'd love to hear some thoughts on all this below, and special thanks as always to all my Patreon supporters, especially Tig. 